Welcome to the Off the Record Podcast with Nick Thielen. I'm here at the Velvet Olive Lounge today in Red Deer, Alberta, and we're here with Jesse Rhodes. Jesse Rhodes is a local musician, entrepreneur, singer-songwriter, and I'm pleased to be joined by him today to talk about some of his music. Right on. I'm happy to be here, Nick. Thanks for having me. Yeah, well, I know you've been playing music. Uh, you're kind of a staple of, of Central Alberta, I would say, and I know you've been playing music for it's a long time. Can you... you can you describe maybe to people what, how, how you would put your, uh, your music in your own words? Oh, man. Um, basically, like, you know, there's no real, like, I don't think there's any rules, so we don't really try to get pigeonholed. But if you had to, you know, nail it down, we do a lot of bluesy, a lot of rock stuff. A lot of people think we're a blues band. A lot of people think we're a rock band. But uh, I like to think there's everything in between and, uh, you know, we do a little bit of folk, we do some, some cool indie stuff. Uh, when we do the big whole five-piece band, we get Curtis LaBelle on the keys and he does his crazy stuff and, you know, it, it adds like the whole E Street vibe almost to it. Sometimes we've had uh, trumpet players, saxophones, yeah. a little bit of everything. So. But if I had to honestly say my favorite thing to do is just get on stage, whether it's just me and a guitar or the whole band and take the crowd and whip them up. Yeah. So. Now in, my, in a little bit of research I did uh, preparing for this interview, I, I, did, I did hear that, you know, you, None you, of it's true. you've been across, you've been, uh, you toured across uh, Canada and you've played a lot of different shows uh, and you started pretty young, if I'm, if I am correct from. I did. Yeah, it was, uh. It was kind of an interesting situation for me. Um, we had found, we, I was in a band in a living room. You know, I was about, I think I was 16 years old at the time and uh, I had already moved out from home. And so my roommate and I, we would jam in the living room all the time and we thought we were the greatest thing ever. So we, we needed to record mm -hmm. and we found this studio who was willing to take our money, which uh, we soon found out later that that's everybody's willing to take your money if you have it. So yeah. um, it it was kind of interesting though. We moved, we went out there, we recorded some stuff, and the guy that owned the place had a little label, and there was a house there, and he kind of pulled me aside and said, you know, I think that uh, I think you got something. I think you need to do this. And I was like, oh man. And so that year, my mom let me drop out of school and this mm. is not uh this is not uh instructional <laughs> or recommended or advice to anyone but my mom let me drop out of school and we packed up all my stuff and she drove me up there and that was that i was i just turned 17 and uh i moved into the studio and to the house that was attached it was called the coop at the time and it was uh it was pretty insane and from that moment on that was it the first first gig I did was at the Sylvan Lake Hotel a couple days later and it was like boom I had been playing already much since then but like when we're talking professional get out there and just commit yeah you know I have from what I heard since. the coop was just like a place for different artists from all over Alberta to come together and kind of record some music yeah something. it was it, it was like a circle for sure and you know it's where Wide Mouth Mason started uh, Johnny McQuaig all that stuff and it was like uh, it, it was just this little gem and it was actually a chicken coop and an old barn that the people who owned it, they, they cut off the one side and they took a tractor and picked it up and moved the coop and put the two buildings together. And That's cool. it was the worst, craziest, uh, quality of life experience I've ever had to this date. And I've played at, uh, I've stayed at Buds on Broadway. So, uh, <laughs> that's saying something. Um, <laughs> Not that there's anything wrong with buds. I, I still continue to stay there. So, um, but it's hilarious because, you know, to think about how I actually got out and started doing it. But did any, did, so did you doing all this and, uh, starting kind of a, you know, a label basically and recording your own music, did that, uh, provide any inspiration or, um, to what you have now where you've started, uh, Deer City Records and, and oh, yeah. Alberta here and. 
Oh yeah, I mean all of it. Like my life is a pretty crazy uh, story, and I always say when they make the movie, and we're we're trying to make a movie. It's been years, but when they make the movie, I don't know who's gonna play me in it, but it's gonna be really cool, and it's gonna be super up and down and crazy and inspirational because so much stuff has happened that you would just you can't really make it up. Like you can't like it's hard to believe that it would be true. Yeah, and so. Uh, to me, I was like, in my head, I thought I was gonna get a record deal right away. And when I started, like, it was still 98, that big giant record deal still existed. It was a thing that, you know, people could get. And I thought, like, okay, this is it, I'm gonna, I'm in. Like, meanwhile, I didn't realize I was in the middle of nowhere in Northern Alberta, in a field, in an old chicken coop, recording music, and it was like, you know, the delusion of what was actually happening but all of that shaped me into you know where we're at now and it it's kind of cool to think about all those things that i went through and uh how it every step kind of brings you brings you closer so the the thing for me was when i realized well i'm not getting a record label deal i was like ah you know it bummed me out for a while but then i thought I already play all the coolest clubs in the mm. country. I, I'm busy all the time. I have an agent that gets me work all the time. And I was like, you know, I know a lot of people that would really kill just to have that steady ability. Mm -hmm. and To be able to put out the Yeah, art. like it, it just, you know, and then I learned how to release my own music. And, you know, essentially you're just doing the things of a label anyways. And then you have different relationships that come and go. and you start doing things for other people that you know other businesses are charging money for and doing this stuff and it kind of just yeah. makes you think hey what if i put this all together and and kind of make something that that is a, a working machine for artists yeah. by artists and i think but that's cool to know, be able to take your connections that you've built over the years and then um and and then uh, be able to be a part of kind of like the ecosystem and keep things going right and uh you know, be, a very small be, part. Yeah, kind of be that boost for people now. That like when you were starting, probably you know you had some yeah. of those people that you looked up to. Oh, definitely, definitely. And I, I probably shouldn't have. You need to choose your role models wisely in this business. And uh, you know, I'm very thankful for the path and the craziness yeah. that it led to and led me out of. At the same time, you know, going through that. Uh, I always try to recommend to anyone who's asking me, like, you know, actually know the people that you're working yeah. with. What fruits of their labor have they, you know, actually put out and that kind of thing. And is the integrity there? All of that stuff. Yeah. If so. there were any, like, mentors or anything like that that helped you through your time, kind of, is there, is there any people that stick out, really? I'd have to say uh, my agent, Trent, is probably, you know, he's been with me since that very first day that I moved up there. Um, he he was part of that family and when that label dissolved and everybody went their own way trent started his own agency and he was like you know uh, and i just kind of came into that so i was the 16 year old kid that met those guys and i'm 40 now i still have the same agent you know this whole time and so we've tried to get rid of each other several times and it never <laughs> seems to work out so we always yeah. end up yeah. back there. Well, so. I wanted to talk a little bit uh, specifically about uh, your music and two, th two, two songs that really stuck out in my head. And uh, I, I guess I'll kind of probably start with the single uh, Sweet Alberta. I want to ask you about it because, uh, you, you know, you're talking about going all over Alberta or all over Canada, really. And um, but obviously you got a lot of special connections here and, and memories. Here. Can yeah. you tell me about writing that song and... and and why? Well, um, I'll be perfectly honest. I didn't write Sweet Alberta, actually. So uh, Sweet Alberta was dominantly written by my bass player, Scotty Weiber. And he was over in England and homesick for his family here and coming home. And it was on the brink of him deciding to come back to Alberta and be a part of this. And actually how I got that song was when I was doing Lovers in a Dangerous Time, uh, I needed some keys and Curtis turned me down said he was busy. <laughs> I needed to flip around that same day. And so Scotty was like, oh, my buddy Jake in England will do it. And uh, 
he sent it back and I was like, oh, that's really cool, I love it. And about a week later, they had sent me an email, I guess, hearing from Scott afterwards, Scott told me that Jake said to him, hey, why isn't Jesse doing that Sweet Alberta song? Like, that's the perfect song mm. for him, you know, and it'll, it'll be really cool. And so they pitched it to me and I respect Scott. Scott's amazing, you know, he's played with everyone from Boy George, Joe Bonamassa, like he's toured all over Europe and Canada and like he, he's a true legend. And so for him to A, be my bass player, B, uh, come in and pitch a song that he wrote and ask me to take it as my own and, and release it, I thought that was a pretty special thing. Mm -hmm. And so they let me be involved. We completely re-recorded it, um, revamped it, you know, made it into something that would fit me. Yeah. And I was very, very fortunate to be a part of that process and to give my opinions and input and mm -hmm. have it, you know, respected and and uh, incorporated into that. So although I didn't write it, um, I definitely feel like it's it's a true Jesse Rhodes song because mm -hmm. it came from within our family. Yeah. And so I love playing that song on stage. Um, Sometimes I do a lot of acoustic solo shows and, and a lot yeah. of times Scotty will be in the audience watching or whatever and I always feel like I'm going to screw that song up <laughs> in front of them. So yeah. I usually do. But well, and that's one thing that I really like about the... I, I, I'm not, you know, being a stand-up comedian, I'm, I'm, I know a little bit about the music scene here, but I'm not as immersed. So that's part of this project, trying to learn a, about Sweet. these musicians. But that's one thing I do love, like dedicated musicians like yourself and Curtis LaBelle that are... That are doing a lot Curtis of Curtis is a machine, man. Yeah, He's awesome. If you want to find out more about him, there's an episode to watch about that as well. Oh, so, sick. But, um, but yeah, uh, and one other song I wanted to talk about uh, that I really enjoy is uh, Bobby Doesn't Know. Okay. That's one of my favorites. Okay. I think because, I don't know. Uh, that's old. I'm, uh, I don't know, man. I just, it's like uh, 20 I'm, uh, years old, man. That's fair. But I'm, uh, I don't know. I, I just like high energy, good music, and I really like the. I'm a big fan of the na na na's towards the yeah. end there, but uh, that's always a good. Yeah. Uh, that's a good time on stage. You get the crowd singing na na na's. Yeah. One time we were playing in Banff, and uh, I was sitting there, and, and Scott and Sam were playing with me, and uh, the manager came up to me, and he was like, "Hey, I want to introduce you to somebody." So I get up and go over there, and they're like, "This is uh, this is Shane. This is Kelly. This is so and so." I'm like, "Okay, cool." And I didn't think anything of it. I had, I was like, whatever. And I go sit down at the table and, and they said to me, oh, they're gonna bring everyone back here tonight. And I was like, okay, cool. Okay. I went and sat back at the table and Sam and Scott are like, I could see they're like freaking out. And I'm like, what are you, what is your guys' problem? And they're like, you don't know who that was. And I'm like, no, I don't know sports. I'm not a sports guy. Uh, I love the Dodgers because I was born the same day they won the World Series, uh, the same hour. And it was, so that, that's a cool thing for me, but that's as far as it goes, really, a little bit of basketball. But these yeah. guys are sports nuts, and they watch all the highlights, all that crap all the time, and we're sitting there, and uh, like, you don't know who that was? And I said, no, I don't. That's Kelly Bookberger, and he's in the Hall of Fame and has a Stanley Cup, and that wow. guy's the goalie for the Maple Leafs. And what had happened was the New York Islanders were in town on a day off playing the flames okay and so they were all there and they came they did they came back to the show and uh kelly bookberger we you know i don't talk hockey i don't know anything about it so mm -hmm. we had a really fun time because i don't think they wanted to talk yeah i know either. exactly so we were just hanging hanging out having some drinks and uh it was pretty awesome i'll never forget that because in that song it's a big huge production the crowd goes crazy and the na na na's and I usually go out in the crowd and do like the whole get them riled up. The and so out. before COVID times, you could, you know, sing with people. And I had Kelly Bookberger sitting there screaming the na na na's with me in a crowd full of 300 people just giving her. Yeah. And uh, that's a moment for me that I'll never really forget because it was like, you know, it was one of those things. And of course, his handler was like, all right, Kelly, it's time to go. Like, yeah. You're, you well, know, you're done. That's one thing too. I I, I I love that song. Sorry. No, that's love fair. That song. I, me too. Yeah, it's a, it's a good one. It's a it's a really good. Uh, I really like storytelling songs. I yeah. feel like, and that's that's one of them. It is. I wrote that with. Uh, I used to write a lot with one of my original songwriting partners. Um, 
His name's Michael John. He was in a band we had called Affliction way back in the day. And uh, we used to write together all the time and we wrote that song after a Jesse Rhodes gig in Pinocchio. And we were uh. like, man, this town is, is messed. And it was like, well, it was the gig that was messed and it just kind of inspired some stuff. And yeah. uh, Earl from Widemouth Mason, the original bass player, he's the one playing bass on that track too. That's so awesome. Yeah. I love that song. I love playing it. I love everything about it. So. Yeah. Well, and uh, I know we'll probably have you play some music in a bit here, but... Uh, Wanted, now I have to play well, those two songs, the hardest songs. Well, I wanted to uh, ask you because I know uh, the Velvet Olive here is a, a special place in your in your lifetime. You've performed here lots, and uh, and uh, you got engaged here. Yeah, um, actually, I think Curtis was playing keys that night with me, and we had someone on saxophone, and uh, we were playing a show, and uh, Kat was here, and I called her up on stage, and proposed to her in the middle of our set and yeah. she said yes thankfully so it was it was good and uh yeah. i love this place it's it's amazing uh we're gonna record a live album in here at the end of this month yeah. with the whole band which will be the first time i've ever had the whole band playing here with drums and do like the big guitar show and yeah. rip off the strings and stuff so this place is awesome kyle's one of my best buds he's he's a really great great dude we have the same birthday and uh you know i just love it here there's there's nothing like the velvet all of anywhere yeah ever. even though it's a small venue you know they have music four or five nights a week locally or yeah. or from this across place gets Canada lit. Or otherwise like it, yeah it can get crazy in here <laughs> it's, it's so it's, much fun it's awesome yeah i mean it's i've met some of the best what i consider uh family from the scene in this room and maintain those friendships and relationships for years i hosted the open mic here for uh, well, a couple different times uh, mm. for over a year. You know, mm. we've we've had some really great times here, and I've never had a bad show here ever. Yeah. Never seen a bad show here ever either. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Well, I wanted to ask. You know, kind of. We we know that you know through these pandemic times or whatever, it's it's uh, it's been hard for musicians and music in general. But what I'm wondering is, you know, like uh, we talk a lot about the impact that that uh, the music has for fans, right? But for for you, has there been any like reflection on you know being able to play music? Whether it's you know, uh, I know you did some uh, like uh, a, basically a live concert throughout the pandemic kind of thing, like for other people yeah. through Zoom. But is there any like kind of introspective in terms of like what it, what it, what it means now to be able to play a show and go out there and entertain people? Is there? A it's. It's been kind of life changing to say the least in the sense of uh, having to adapt. You know, when this first happened, I wasn't sure what was what was going to happen at first. You know, it was just two weeks and everybody would be better and we'd be all good. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it was very clear quite soon to me that this was going to be a long, a long game situation. And so... Mm -hmm. I tried to shift into the live streaming side of things quite early and, and we did a show for Banff and it was, you know, that's one of my other, what I would consider like a hometown gig. I love that place. And yeah. um, that was really cool. It went really well. And I remember doing that and I just had my phone set up and that was it. Like I had my phone facing me and that was how I did the stream, mm -hmm. you know, and then fast forward a year later and we had. 12 cameras and a whole PA system set up and everything else, five piece band. And we're streaming to Germany, to New York and Chicago. And it was like, you know, a lot of, a lot of time and effort went into some of that planning and figuring out how to do that. And, um, but honestly, none of like, and even to this day, I'm still, I can't think of one single show that we did. We did a couple at the VAT. Uh, we did one in Edmonton, um, and it was it was the same, you know. As much as it felt good to be on stage with the boys and mm -hmm. like playing and and having a good time, it it just felt like a rehearsal for something, you know. Yeah. And it was like it's so hard to make that connection with the audience because you don't get the instant oh, response. It's crazy. The first things we did, I think we did April. Uh, the first gigs I did for a real audience was at Blues on White in, 
I, I think it would have been April of 2021, whenever there was a break there mm -hmm. and they lifted stuff and it was yeah. like, okay. And I went and it was insanity. You know, we had two, 300 people at the stage. All the wings are full. Everything is, is crazy. Mm -hmm. And I was, I was standing up there and I remember looking at Sam and thinking like, like, is this, this was our first go back at like being on stage and mm -hmm. it just literally blew my mind and made me realize also like how much we miss it. A song like Bobby, you know, you want to talk about that. That's where everyone sings it back to you because it's so old and everyone knows it. And they're just like, you know, that really kind of hits you in the yeah. feels and you're like, man, I friggin miss this. That's like, what I love about that song too. It's, so it's easy, easy to remember and yeah. sing along to. Yeah. And um, yeah, I mean, so it, it's been hard to adapt for sure. It, it has, but you know, we've tried to, mm -hmm. we try to do it for a good cause. We try to like, you know, make, make ends meet. Um, I will say, I know some people are financially doing well from the live streaming and stuff like that. I have yet to make any money live streaming. Yeah. <laughs> it seems to cost me a lot more money to do the setups and everything else, which I'm okay with because it gives us a chance to get together and play, but nothing beats being in front of a couple hundred people yeah. just loving life. And well, and I think that's maybe a good, a good thing, good segue into, uh, you know, for me personally, like, you know, my mental health is really important and I have my physical challenges, but I know for you it's a personal thing as well. I know you've done some um, fundraising and shows for uh, mental health and uh, yeah. related to your sister. And uh, can you tell me kind of a little bit about sure. you know, how that yeah. started and why you um, Well, my sister was uh, really my older sister. So I come from a family of five. And my older sister was a couple years older than me. She was 79, I'm 81. And it was, uh, it was her that really shaped my interest in music and my mm -hmm. love of the actual performance side of it as opposed to just listening to the music. You know, she kind of introduced me to that love of like, well, this is what it looks like. This is what a cool band looks like. This is, you know, until, until I was hearing Nine Inch Nails and Anthrax coming out of my sister's room, I was listening to Jerry Lee Lewis and Elvis and practicing mm -hmm. my, my Elvis lip for years before uh, my sister kind of just shaped me into it. And I remember hearing the Black Crows and I was like, wow, I was like, that's, that's like Elvis, but like, that's like, so hard, that's hitting me rock, so yeah. weirdly different, you know? And that changed my outlook big time. So she was a big, part of that and then as we got older um, we loved the shows we loved the aspect of being at a show and I went to my first concert with her and uh, you know it was just we had a bond over music that was quite quite different we used to put on uh, fundraiser shows back in our hometown when we were kids and we would you know set up and charge two bucks or get a food donation and we would just donate it all and we'd have eight or nine punk rock bands because that's you know that was the music i was getting into at that yeah. point and uh and it was awesome you know it was really good and when she passed away you know it was uh she passed away quite young she was 33 and uh you know that that was a hard thing for me to deal with mm -hmm. um my family's experienced uh, extensive amount of loss and trauma uh, in that sense. And so around that time with my mom and my grandmother and then my sister's uh, oldest daughter, and it was just all kind of, you know, in that immediate time. And so when my sister passed, it was um, kind of one of those things where, you know, everything just kind of stops and you, you try to process and, as time went on, it uh, it became easier for me just to kind of stuff it down a bit. And so, um, you know, I, I kind of did that and I, I still do that to to a point. Um, but I've, I wanted a way to remember her legacy of like what it meant to me uh, mm -hmm. as a sibling and inspiration. And it seemed like every year on her birthday, I was I was always playing a show. And, uh, you know, in my head, I'd be like, you know, this one, this one's for you kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, several years ago, I thought, well, hey, I should really try and do something out of this and do like an actual fundraiser. And so we, we try to 
we try to give back and now I plan a show every year on August 11th and uh, do it for a charity and we have a lot of sponsors in in town I usually do it in Red Deer mm -hmm. and uh, everyone from uh, some of the hotels and stuff um, the Cambridge there they donate a, a room as like a prize and it's it's just a kind of a cool fun way to get everyone together have a cool show do something for a good cause and um, whether it be for uh, CMHA or anything the food bank or um, you know the child advocacy center any of that stuff yeah it all to me boils down to mental health because at the end of the day you can't you can't have good mental health if any of those things are awry in your world because I mean that's where it stops is, yeah. is up here right so you know I 100% agree because you know uh, I've been doing stand-up comedy for a few years and kind of I love your comedy by the way you're one of my favorites well thanks out I, there yeah it's well it, it sort of similar in the sense that like you know we go through this stuff and some of it comes from this you know these dark places or to help you get through the tough times and so it's uh, it's definitely finding that balance so I appreciate you saying that. Um, all right, well, that was that was awesome. And now we're gonna check out one of Jesse's Jesse Road songs, "Sweet Alberta." It's five a.m. in the city of sleeps. I'm upside down under the stars. Rode a red arrow into town last night Shot me right into a bar Threw back a whiskey straight on the rocks That's when she caught my eye and Gave me a black and gold brush to the head I never felt so alive She's a mountain high She's a big blue sky she came and she rescued me She told me it was alright Close your eyes Think of me when you're lost in the night She said it's alright I'm by your side I knew I didn't deserve her But I got everything I need Sweet Alberta Sweet Alberta Sweet Alberta Sweet Alberta, sweet Alberta it Was a quarter to twelve when she walked me up the road My feet were no friends of mine I heard Alberta whisper in my ear Happiness ain't hard to find She's a prairie wind, my hope within She came and she rescued me Told me it was alright Close your eyes Think of me when you're lost in the night She said it's alright I'm by your side I knew I didn't deserve her But I got everything I need Sweet Alberta Sweet Alberta Sweet Alberta Sweet Alberta Sweet Alberta Flowers spinning in my head I lay on my back Cause she was my bed Says alright Open your eyes It's 5 a.m. And there were stars in the sky Said it's alright By your side I knew I didn't deserve her But I got everything I need Sweet Alberta Alberta, sweet Alberta, sweet Alberta, sweet Alberta. Well, that was a great song, and I love that song, Jesse, just because, you know, um, sometimes I just think that Alberta is really, really cold, and I get too <laughs> stuck on the fact that it's really cold, but there are really awesome people and really awesome there things is. here. So. There's a lot to be thankful for about Alberta, I think, that gets overlooked. And uh, that song, every time I sing it, it means something more to me. So I agree. 
Could I ask you to play one more for me? I would love to, Nick. All right, well. You want to hear Bobby? Yeah, I would love Bobby to hear Bobby doesn't know? Yeah, I love All that right. song. Uh, one of the reasons I love it, and we were talking a little bit earlier about, uh, you know, the energy, particularly in that song, and, you know, you're talking a little bit about punk rock. Uh, it might seem weird. I'm, I'm about 100 pounds and, you know, skinny guy, but I like, I like going to a punk rock concert and uh, a couple times where, you know, I've almost been... Uh, People get a bit aggressive, but I just enjoy <laughs> that, right? And people are like, yeah, but you got the sticks, you can just give them one of those. Yeah. You know, I was, <laughs> I remember going to a concert and somebody asked me, you know, should you be at this concert right now? Because it's a little too intense. And I was like, I'm here <laughs> just like you, and I'm going to prove God, that I belong yeah, here, right? So, absolutely. Yeah, so I don't know. It's absolutely, one of those things man. where I just enjoy the. You got to get in there. And maybe not fully into the mosh pit, but around the edges a little bit is where. You're crazy if you go full full mosh pit, anyways. You don't want to be there. That's no good for nobody. Yeah, fair <laughs> enough, but just like to try it once in a while. So. Yeah, that's fair. Them kids are stealing that car. Hi. As the sky, Bobby doesn't know any better. He's been out all night in the dead of the weather. He's got pills in his pocket, dots in his head. Sooner or later, he'll turn up dead. But Bobby doesn't care about nobody. He's on his own, he don't need no one. Bobby doesn't know about the rock and roll. Bobby just doesn't know any better now Never felt the blues, ain't got no soul Don't know, rock and roll Life to lose, he's down in a hole oh, oh. Those girls are chasing their dreams Good as it feels well, Katie met Bobby on a Saturday night They took too much until it felt alright Well, Katie didn't like Bobby for real She only wanted his pockets for what she could steal Well, late one night she was all alone Katie took too much and now she's kind of home Well, Katie didn't know about the rock and roll Katie just didn't know any better now Never felt the blues, ain't got no soul Didn't know rock and roll Life to lose, digging a hole oh, oh. Hey Jesse, I just want to say thanks a lot for playing that song. I really love it, and uh, 
appreciate the time talking to you today and yeah, getting man. to know you a little bit more. And uh, the, the, thanks for having me. You know the stories it. you've told on the road and. Um, Thanks for sharing your music with us. Of course, anytime. And thanks everybody for tuning into the Off the Record podcast with Nick Thielen. I'll see you next time for another great episode.